So welcome back to day two of TEST 2023. Um, just as we started yesterday uh, with Elder Wabagoon, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and that Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And I, as I was out walking my dog this morning <clears throat> at an unheard of hour, because the clocks haven't changed and it was still dark and it was the first um, time I heard the phrase wind chill this season, um, so we were both appropriately parked up. Yes, my dog and I have matching parkas. Um, I'm that guy. Um, so uh, we were out walking this morning and the sun was coming up and I sort of, I found myself um, looking in the four directions and spending some time thinking about yesterday and the water ceremony and how important it was despite the fact that I live at a very busy intersection in downtown Toronto that standing in the place on the land and acknowledging the four directions and, and, and creating space to think about um, what is in those directions, what's coming from those directions, and perhaps who's waiting for me in some of those directions, um, I thought was pretty powerful. And I didn't intentionally do it, I just found myself doing it. Um, my dog was less interested in standing and holding space in four directions um, because she was like, dude, it's cold. Um, but um, if you get a chance today, if you have a, t a time, even if it's out by the windows, just take a few moments to ground yourself. Um, feel your, get your feet feeling flatter on the floor. Take a deep breath in. And remember what a gift it is to be in the place that we are in, especially so close um, to Lake Ontario and everything that it has, it has to offer. Um, so yesterday was a fantastic day, I think. Do you think so? Good. Good. I promised people that I wouldn't pick on them and ask them what they learned. I did say that I might tell, they can tell me who to pick on, but we will uh, we'll reserve that. Um, what I found interesting over the course of listening to yesterday's sessions was, and maybe this is just my bias and how I like to hear things and, and see things, um, was this sort of overarching question about who gets to hold the power of knowledge, who gets to hold power in creating knowledge, um, who gets to hold power around the verification and credentialing of knowledge, and to what end? Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a scholar practitioner in education. Um, Michel Foucault, is, he's one of my homeboys. I, uh, I'm a big fan. But as we think about power in this particular space, it can also be a positive thing. And I think that we often talk about power as negative, and I think it can be very negative in many, many ways. But when we're talking about you know, digitally enabled and, and aware and critically uh, thoughtful learners, um, we're thinking about how they can actually understand the power relations of information. Uh, we're seeing it unfold in our media year after year. We're seeing it unfold in classrooms as students have greater agency over the creation of, of knowledge and expressing themselves. Um, and we're seeing it unfold in real time as post-secondary institutions grapple with, well, what's this AI thing? How do we either prevent it or deal with it? And I sort of chuckle and went, hey, team, the call's coming from inside the house. <laughs> That's a byproduct of institutional research. And so how do we look at the potential rather than the power as a negative um, to help better our students, their experiences, and ultimately the greater good. Our program today promises, of course, to be just as enriching and exciting as it was yesterday, and there's lots to get through. Um, we have um, some vendor pitches happening over the course of lunch today, I believe, um, where you'll be able to hear some really quick snapshots of what our vendors have to offer. Or, sorry, it'll be over the break. Um, and so make sure you stay in place and hear what it is that they have to say. Um, I also want to signal for you that after our breakout sessions in the afternoon, we will come back together in this room. Just as Elder Wabagoon um, helped us to open together as a community in a good way, we're going to close together as a community in a good way. So I invite you to resist the urge to throw on your scarf and your parka and get really immersed in that rush hour traffic. Um, but come back here 
and uh, reconnect with, with one another and of course with the, the reason as to why we're here as educators. So, it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, Minister Dunlop, who will be joining us virtually. Minister Jill Dunlop has been the member of provincial parliament for Simcoe North since 2018. Born and raised in the town of Coldwater in Simcoe North, Jill witnessed the importance of community and small local businesses early on as her grandparents owned and operated Dunlop Plumbing, and her parents were actively engaged community members. Prior to being elected, Jill attended Western University and later joined the faculty at Georgian College. She's also the mother of three post-secondary age daughters, all giving her unique insights into the world of higher education. And in 2019, Jill was appointed Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues in the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services. And in 2021, she was appointed Minister of Colleges and Universities and was reappointed to that post in June 2022. Welcome to the screen, the Honorable Minister Jill Dunlop. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to eCampus for having me. It's wonderful to be back. Unfortunately, I am not able to be with you in person today. It's the fall economic statement. I have to be in an early morning briefing, so unfortunately I can't be there, but I know it's going to be a wonderful conference. Off the top, I think we're at a very interesting crossroad when it comes to digital learning. Just a few years ago, the ability to access high-quality post-secondary education online was considered a nice-to-have in many cases. And then, as the entire world navigated the impacts of a global pandemic, digital learning quickly shifted from a want to a true need. Today, with many post-secondary students back to learning on traditional campus, where does that leave us when it comes to digital learning? As drastically as the pendulum has swung in recent years, I would argue this, there's really no going back. So many exceptional advancements have been made in the world of digital learning. So many doors have opened and possibilities realized. Today and going forward, digital learning will continue to be a key player, not just a supporting character in the future of post-secondary education. Since 2020, the government has made historic investment of over $70 million in a digital learning strategy for Ontario. And there have been hundreds of excellent projects supported to date that are expanding access to hybrid education, which leads me to the third phase of the strategy, a focus on supporting priority areas of digital learning at colleges, universities, and Indigenous institutes across Ontario, so we can continue to have a positive impact. This includes building hybrid learning capacity so post-secondary education can be accessed and taught with maximum flexibility without losing the high quality nature of the experience. Our third phase also focuses on ensuring institutions are offering digital learning in an accessible way. For example, by aligning digital teaching and learning policies with Accessibility for Ontario's with Disabilities Act requirements and developing open education resources or OERs with the open library and open publishing infrastructure, or working to integrate OER platforms for a more seamless user experience, and developing more content that supports underserved communities as well as the Francophone community. In fact, there's already work underway at eCampus Ontario to increase access to French language digital teaching and learning resources. For example, I know they reached an impressive milestone this past summer with the creation and launch of the French version of the Ontario Extend program. This micro-credential program empowers educators to explore a range of emerging technologies and best practices, knowledge that will help them teach more effectively and help their students learn more effectively online. With over 76 educators registered in the program so far, we're helping promote equitable access to education for French-speaking Ontarians. When it comes to micro-credential programming like the one I just mentioned, I fully anticipate it will play a bigger role in the digital learning space for years to come. Often offered online, micro-credentials support lifelong learners with the skills they need to quickly prepare for the jobs of a modern economy and drive strong partnerships between employers and the post-secondary sector. I know that we all recognize the value of partnerships and collaboration to equip learners with the skills employers are looking for. That's why I'm proud to say that as announced in the 2023 Ontario budget, 
our government is investing $5 million in a second round of the Micro-Credential Challenge Fund. The application period will launch mid-November, and I look forward to seeing submissions from the post-secondary institutions here today, along with their industry partners, to develop more micro-credentials that respond to regional labour market needs. Today's conference is a great opportunity to come together and celebrate our successes in hybrid learning and learn more about how we can take these even further to help Ontario build a competitive, innovative and skilled workforce. I want to thank eCampus Ontario for their work in organizing this tremendous conference. With the exceptional lineup of speakers on the agenda and the leaders in attendance, the ideas that shape here today will go a long way to increasing our flexible and accessible post-secondary education sector for more Ontarians. Thank you again and enjoy your day. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. Oh, that's loudish. Echoey, is that okay? It's just loud for me. Um, thank you. Uh, welcome back for day two of TESS. Um, I hope you enjoyed yesterday's sessions and made good use of the photo booth. I forgot to bring my little stack of photos because I was going to wear them as like a handkerchief in my uh, suit jacket today. Um, I did have a first sound of disappointment when I saw that the photo booth was not there today, but somebody pointed out to me that you could go stand where the photo booth was <laughs> and take a selfie and it'll be like the, it'll be like you're in the photo booth and just use the hashtag test uh, 2023. So I encourage you to do that and I'll happily take a selfie with you because I have long arms. I can do that very well. Um, so thanks a lot uh, to Minister Dunlop for the inspiring message. Um, it's really great to hear some of the themes um, picked up. There's no going back is one of the things that uh, she said at the outset, and I'm going to return to that, this, this issue of time, because I think it's really important. Uh, also the issues of digital empowerment, uh, and also the importance of, of expanding digital learning and hybrid learning uh, for our Francophone learners. Where's our Francophone team? See Cyrielle over there. We have a whole bunch of people here who are working. Hello, take a wave, thank you. Uh, Andrea was helping me yesterday with my, uh, with my, my uh, pronunciation, so I'm forever grateful for that. L'élément humain. Merci beaucoup. Uh, but it's really good to hear about the essential nature of digital learning and what it means to supporting an innovative and competitive Ontario. And it's also great to see that the government sees digital learning as a key player and not a supporting actor in post-secondary education. This certainly accords with what we all know here. Minister Dunlop outlined some of the ways uh, the third round of the virtual learning strategy is continuing to support our institutions with a focus on priority areas and continuing to have a positive impact building hybrid learning capacity. Now I think about this as sticking the landing. The virtual learning strategy was a three year $70 million investment in digital learning capabilities as you all know and it continues to have a significant impact. We did an economic impact analysis a little while ago to find out, well, what's the value of the, the government's investment in virtual learning? And these are the results. For every $1 that the government invests, you as an institution receive $5 in benefit. And that's about $650,000 a year in value of the kind of programs and platforms that we provide that you don't have to pay for or maybe couldn't pay for. And that's really important. Uh, students gain even more value, over $15 million uh, of value per year uh, that benefit their learners because we're providing support for faculty, so people who teach and, and uh, learners to, uh, to learn. And all of that is helping, to Ontario, helping Ontario to compete globally. It's all very important. As Minister Dunlop mentioned, we're focused on increasing accessibility. We're all uh, you know, working towards realizing the requirements, but also the benefits of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act, which will come into effect in 2025. We're building more open learning resources. Our, where's our open library team? Take a wave. Oh, there's Mary, our head librarian. <laughs> Running the uh, open library, which is now federated into how many institutions? 24 total, that's fantastic. If, that deserves a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> a 
Libraries are our secret weapon. Our superpower is probably the way to put it uh, in terms of um, how we're supporting uh, digital learning. Uh, and I've already mentioned the support that we're doing for our francophone uh, institutions, uh, which is creating more and better opportunities for learners everywhere. Minister Dunlop mentioned the new Micro-Credentials Challenge Fund, which uh, should be hitting the streets in a couple of, uh, couple of weeks, which is great. Um, I would encourage you to check out the latest developments of the Micro-Credential Portal, where you can go and enter your uh, current job title or desired job title, and it will tell you what skills and competencies you need and what programs offered by your institutions will help you get those. So that's uh, a really, really great benefit. We're working with the Future Skills Centre and the Conference Board on that, uh, operationalizing labour market information and occupation-specific data to help learners make informed decisions. The focus on partnerships and collaboration is also key. This is one of the six elements of digital transformation, and I would encourage you to go and uh, visit. Oh, I got a roaming mic. Here, have a, have a go and visit digitalcampus.ca and check out the six dimensions of digital, uh, digital transformation. Anybody want to take a guess at what those six are? This is amazing. I thought I was stuck on the stage. There's more of these. Building partnerships and collaboration is one of them. I don't have my notes with me now suddenly, so I'm a little lost. Uh, open education is another one. Empowering digital learners, leaders. Empowering digital leaders, thank you. Um, what haven't I said? Investigating digital technologies. I've already talked about finding strategic partners and developing tomorrow's workforce. That's why we're here. I also realized that I got a timer down here, which I am now way off. Today's speakers, as yesterday's, are going to be unpacking all of these dimensions. So I want to thank Minister Dunlop and the Ontario government uh, for the support that they've given our sector. Uh, Minister Dunlop is a tireless advocate for education, uh, providing leadership and support for digital learning is an essential part of our world-leading post-secondary education system. So I found day one of TESS to be incredibly rewarding. At the outset, Stephen Murphy, one of the co-chairs uh, of eCampus Ontario, asked that we think about digital learning as essential experiences in a global context. Anne-Marie Vaughan, our other co-chair, reminded us that we are the change makers. My experience of yesterday shows this to be true. And we are ushering in the futures of learning, co-designing this together. I also want to acknowledge that we have three other board members in the room, Aldo Caputo, Jenny Heyman, and Lori Harrison, I'm not sure if, is Lori here today? She was here yesterday. Um, so I was chatting with some folks yesterday about the future of learning and I heard uh, from many about the excellent session exploring artifacts in the futures of post-secondary education by our research and foresight team. Take away research and foresight team. They're all over there in the corner. <laughs> So this team, Elisa, Rocio, Janine, Durga, Debedita, Cheryl, and Laura are doing exemplary work in helping us understand the futures of education. So if you had a chance to see that, uh, you were one of the lucky ones. I was not. I get to work with them every day though, so I can ask them about it. Foresight helps us understand the what and the how of digital learning. This is the OER, the AR, the VR, the AI, the work integrated learning. Foresight also helps us understand the why. And as I said yesterday, in supporting the digitally empowered learner, we're creating not just the future of learning, but the future of work. This is also the future of social interaction and the future of civic engagement. And this is a special responsibility. All of you are part of envisioning the futures of post-secondary education. So I was talking to somebody yesterday and it occurred to me that this means we're time travelers. Work with me on this. We live in the future tense, the way things will be. So we come together in a forum like this to meet other travelers and to share ideas, to learn about these potential futures. And when we return to our organizations, we step back in time to today and the way things are now. And then we set to work, plotting our courses forward with inspiration as our North Star. This inspiration comes from each and every one of you. Now I'm inspired by you and by the many conversations I had yesterday that challenged me and that enabled me to learn stuff I didn't know. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity. 
Today we have another set of excellent uh, discussions that will help us navigate our way through designing the futures of learning and empowering digital learners. Dr. Nicole Johnson is here today to give us a glimpse of current digital learning trends. And this is always a highlight for me, and it's a key way we can understand the paths that we are on. For trends are like artifacts of the past. They inform the present, and they help us, in turn, plot the future. So there's many sessions today that will provide you with ample food for thought, from skills to curiosity, emerging technologies and opportunities to engage with the what, the how, and the why of digital learning and digital empowerment. First though, a little red light over here saying that I'm like literally three minutes over my time. Red, it's flashing. First though, we're going to hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Bonnie Stewart. Dr. Stewart here is here to talk to us about preserving the participatory digital empowerment in an age of AI. Dr. Bonnie Stewart is Associate Professor of Online Pedagogy and Workplace Learning at the University of Windsor. She's an educator and social media researcher interested in the implications of digital networks for institutions and society. And I suspect, Chris, that she would be able to talk to you about Michel Foucault and the regimes of truth that exist in the surveillance society. I haven't had to talk about that in many years, so thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Stewart has extensive background in digital and participatory education. She was an early uh, MOOC researcher and ethnographer of academic Twitter. Uh, she has also explored the shifting landscape of digital platforms and practices for more than a decade. Dr. Stewart's research currently examines educators' data literacies across an increasingly extractive environment and emphasizes participatory paths to creating belonging in digital spaces. Dr. Stewart is consistently curious about what it means to know and to learn and to be a citizen in our current information ecosystem, and she takes joy in raising provocations and possibilities with students and professional peers. This promises to be fantastic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bonnie Stewart to our main stage. Good morning. How are you? You okay? Great. Okay, I'm excited to know that the red button is there. Um, I think everyone can hear me. I'm getting a fair amount of, and I, but no echo from the, all right, fabulous. Um, so I appreciate that. I appreciate the welcome very much. And I guess I just wanted to start by focusing my, myself a little. Uh, I like to begin by thinking about where we are um, on this land, where we have all come from, uh, some of the polluted inheritances of colonialism that have brought us here, that continue to work in the world, where we are in time in a hurting world, uh, where we are in terms of how we take up this call to strategy and being part of the future and empowerment, and what empowerment means and for whom. And so what I want to take up, my humble little sticky note here, <laughs> my background in this is not an answer. Um, it's just a nested series of experiences that I'm going to kind of run through. Uh, some of this will be interactive, so if you are hoping just to sit and chill out. You'll get to sit, but I am hoping to have uh, a couple of moments of table conversation just to flesh out what I mean. If you've seen me speak before, uh, this first bit may seem like, huh, she's still doing the same stuff she did 10 years ago. Well, I'm not talking about academic Twitter anymore. <laughs> not at all, actually. <laughs> um, but my work has always been focused on participatory learning. I come out of an adult ed background in digital spaces and as part of the times and spaces that we are. And where we're going today 
there'll be three pieces that I kind of want to bring up with you. One is the idea of digital participation. One is the question and the reality of digital extraction. And one is this idea, and you'll notice the question mark at the end, of digital empowerment. But to begin, I offer you the internet. <laughs> Floating past the private property sign, burning on fire. <laughs> and I think that this is a lovely encapsulation of some of what we need to talk about when we talk about digital empowerment. Because I do feel like we can put all of the fabulous possibilities and pretty stickers on things that we wish to, but we still need to address some of this issue. So I begin, how many of you remember when the internet was once a fun place for watching cat videos instead of monitoring the real-time collapse of late-stage capitalism? My people. How many of you remember Web 2.0 and the fabulous, a lot of us came in, Kyle Mackey, I see you. <laughs> Raise your fist in solidarity. Exactly. Uh, there was a time, right, where I, I first started doing digital work during my master's in the late 90s. I fell into it backwards because I happened to be the person who was in the master's of education program, vaguely looking at the idea of how the tools of a given time impact what it means to know in that time. It was very Foucault-oriented. Um, but I was substitute teaching in the, um, in the school system there, and they needed somebody to suddenly teach their faculty how to teach online when they started teaching online. So they said, hey, you master's student, you're young, you must know how to use a computer, you're studying technology. This is a, this is a long pattern, I'm sure many of you have had career arcs that began in similar ways. And at that time, probably 1997 or 98, the internet was just moving from the, we put the Encyclopedia Britannica on CD-ROM, woohoo, to a space that allowed for interaction. And by peak web 2.0, we were in you know, the read-write web, and I became a blogger. That was, I actually was not doing digital education for a few years. I was just engaging in this participatory space where I would comment on somebody's site and then they would come back and comment at me and gradually you got to know who these people were and there was this whole network of people who began to have a sense of each other and what each other thought out there outside of the confines of the very small town that I happened to live in at that time. And so this anatomy of a social network, the idea is, you know, each dot is essentially an entity, whether it's a person or the New York Times or, but it's a thing. And the line between them is the relationship, essentially, of trust or hesitancy. It, it's the sum total of whatever interactions have happened kind of between those two entities and the sense that they've created. How many of you have a phone in your pocket? Okay, pretty much everybody. We live in a time where there is more information available to all of us at any given moment than existed in the entire university library um, when I started university in 1989, um, I went to Mount Allison, it's a small university. Uh, absolutely, more access and information available to all of us like that than I could have gotten in my university library. But here's the important piece, right? That knowledge abundance, it's not new, it's been building ever since folks started writing stuff down and keeping track of things, that knowledge abundance can, is nothing that we can ever touch, right? So I still never read all of the books in my university library. Um, 
I could never. I would still be there reading. We live surrounded by more than we will ever take in. And so to an extent, I, I think this puppy is kind of cute. Has anybody here ever tried to drink from a hose? Okay. <clears throat> what happens? You get wet. <laughs> right? It is very difficult to get the little bit of water that you might want in a graceful way ingested into your body if you're trying to drink from a hose. In terms of information and knowledge, we are always trying to drink from a hose. We might want a couple of droplets, but it's coming at us hard and big, and we are basically swimming around, uh, and what we need are filters often more than more water. And that creates overload. And sometimes, particularly of late, I find myself once again almost kind of wondering if I could just turn the web or the internet or the world off just so I had a minute to process. I want to try something. I don't know if it's going to work, zero promises. But this is a little experiment to talk about one of the ways that we can deal with knowledge abundance in a participatory way. So I'm going to tell you a very important piece of information. Okay? My favorite color is red. I, not orangey red, actually, like red red, but that's fine, red. Now, what I would like you to do, if you don't have a favorite color, you are not obliged to pick one at this moment. You can fake it, or you can choose to sit this out, but if you have a favorite color and you are willing, I am going to ask you to turn to a person next to you and share that favorite color with them with a little eye contact and fist bump, okay? Would you do that, please? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, don't make me use my teacher voice. <laughs> now, this is always the point at which everything, it's wonderful, but I just wanna explain something. So now I'd like to do an envisioning exercise. Okay, you've listened to me and you've done something yourselves and we're gonna do one more thing. When I tell you my favorite color is red, I would like you to envision something. I would like you to envision a red thread that goes out from me to you and to you and to you and to you, okay? And to each person in this room. So can you envision what that looks like? I'm kind of like a overabundant octopus. Um, many, many red threads going out all over the room. Great, you've got that vision. Now, counter, I would like you to envision the first person that, because I, I know that some of you fist bumped with two people and you are getting ahead of the game, okay? <laughs> and, and thank you. Um, but picture the first person that you fist bumped with, okay? Um, that fist bump as also an exchange of threads. So, who did you first fist bump with? Okay, and what was your favorite color? Pink. Pink, and what was your favorite color? It was red, it was red. lovely color, nice choice. <laughs> so, I would like each person to imagine between these two people are a pink and a red thread going back and forth. Can everybody see that? Great. Can you picture your own fist bump as an exchange of colors? Great. Now here's where it becomes a complete hot mess. I welcome you to it. Uh, I'm going to get you to take your first friend's color of thread and I'm going to get you to pass it on to another person through another fist bump, okay? So by not saying your own favorite color this time, but rather this person here, their favorite color is pink or red or blue or whatever. Please go ahead and then I'm gonna call you back in about 
15 seconds. Okay, so thank you. So I just want to know, did you do it? Did you pass it on? Okay. Abdullah. <laughs> uh, you should have sat in the back, it's true. Um, okay, so whose color thread did you pass on? You passed on purple, so you passed a purple thread from you to you to her? Perfect, so now there's a purple thread that's connecting. And I'm assuming that you passed on a thread, perhaps to the person next to you. If you envision these threads that keep getting passed on, what starts to happen in this room? Right? We have a whole web of connections. Can everybody kind of see what that would look like? Imagine if I said, okay, that's the end of the talk, thank you so much, please keep passing on these colors. Eventually, you'd be like, okay, this is actually, I don't really care what people's favorite color is, but you would be passing on an item of information. Eventually, you would lose track of the people to whom it connected, right? Once you get outside your table or whatever, you no longer have that point of eye contact, that fist bump, so that the thread that was coherent early on can become something that maybe travels around the room, but is not as much connected to that sense of that moment as it is at the beginning. If I said, okay, now imagine that there was one favorite color that suddenly spread through this room like wildfire, and everybody was like What would be the context? in which that would happen, because again, favorite colors are not usually you know, <clears throat> secret information. How or why would, would somebody's favorite color actually travel through the room in a big whisper network? Jenny. And, okay, so imagine we had somebody super famous who was sitting in this room, right here in this chair, and I'm not saying that we don't have somebody who's super famous in this room, all right, if you are super famous, I see you and I honor you, but here we are. Um, but imagine someone whose name everyone knew. That piece of information, because we're human, right? How many of you have ever lived in a small town? Gossip networks, whisper networks. <laughs> that piece of information, what, did you hear? There's one other way in which, so that node, in the network, right? That person essentially represents a large amount of influence and therefore the communications that come out from them spread more. The other reason why a piece of information might travel really far, any, any ideas? Yeah, at the back. Okay, let's say, say we started tweeting it, but, well, okay, let's not talk about Twitter. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, let's say that we started sharing that on a social media network that was not uh, deeply flawed at this point. Um, but honestly, is, is it going to go anywhere? If I start tweeting my favorite color or sharing my favorite color on Instagram, let's be honest, nobody gives a hoot, right? Um, unless there is a taboo favorite color. If there's a taboo favorite color, and I'm not supposed to say that my favorite color is green or whatever, that might be something that would circulate, okay, well beyond me. Otherwise, those communications are probably just gonna go so far. This is a metaphor for the participatory web. In participatory communications, the key piece Okay, you may only, if you look up at the, the picture there of that pile of thread, you may only have access to that little part that is your favorite color. 
right? But you were part of spreading that communication. So I, can, I remember the person that I fist bumped. I remember the face. I remember the connection. That is how those nodes built. And that is what participatory learning was built on in a digital sense. It came out of realizing that the web allows us ways to make contacts with people around things that are actually real to us, not always terribly important, but we have that sense of a human on the other side there. It's not just throwing stuff out into the digital. Oh, whoops, I went backwards, my bad. Participatory learning brought into the classroom, and this is what I started doing about 10, 15 years ago, in the digital sense allowed me to do the same thing. I got my students to make, these are some examples of artifacts that my students did. Some of them were actually uh, overviewing the eCampus Ontario uh, modules for teachers. Uh, so they would make infographics about the technologist module, or they would make uh, sketch notes, and they would share them, and people out in the web would be like, oh, I appreciate that. And what I was trying to do more than anything was give my students a sense that as they go out to being teachers, digital tools are not just faceless things that allow you to produce something shiny, but they are ways for your students to contribute to knowledge abundance and to make small connections in the world. And this quote from Henry Jenkins, who's one of the early thinkers of participatory digital work in school, it shifts the focus of literacy, not just from an individual possession, right? I can decode or write or make meaning, but to a collective and community experience where we are building literacies. Digital empowerment in a participatory environment means opening up those human possibilities where you can have that sense that on the other end of that communication is a person you can fist bump. Simple message. And has anyone ever seen these before? These are some of the um, cards from the Stanford Design School. Uh, they're they're anti-oppressive education cards, and they are focused on ways of engaging in participatory spaces in ways that own the power dynamics between us as humans and try to enable um, contribution to knowledge abundance in ways that don't just reinforce existing oppressive power dynamics. So this is just something that I have used with my students many times to help focus how do we work towards equity in these messy spaces. Um, if I'm asking you to share with people, where are we sharing from? All of those questions. Great. Wonderful. Fabulous. This is what I was doing. Loving it. Really excited about it. And from the mid-2000s until about 2015, 2016. And then I started to really feel uncomfortable with some of what I was doing. Not because the people out there had particularly changed, but because the, way, the platforms that I had to do it on had really started to shift in focus. And how many of you, do we have any medieval historians in the room? Is there a doctor in the house? Um, okay, good. I'm glad because I am not a medieval historian and I'm about to give you a 12 second version of medieval English history, which is that the peasants used to have common land that they could grow their food on and suddenly, I don't know, somewhere around 1200 or something, somebody in power decided that that's not really your land and we're going to build fences around it. And I see you shaking your head and you probably know this better than I do, but, <laughs> but it, that land became enclosed. Some of our private property concepts, et cetera, come out of that era. Also uh, for the people who were growing their food on that land, there's a huge, very real, very material loss, right? We have something of a parallel that is happening with 
the open knowledge commons that was built on that participatory connective web. And I think it was Audrey Waters who first introduced me to this concept about, sorry, about 10 years ago. I won't use this hand. So there's a shift in the power relations that happen, and this is a tweet of mine from like 2016 from a conference. We started to have platforms that existed much more overtly for the purposes of profit and for the purposes of efficiency and for the purposes of not necessarily building connections and community, but rather the purposes of making that startup or that platform extremely successful. In the digital space, in education, conceiving education essentially as a large and untapped funding source for those companies. And it kept exacerbating. Um, anybody got a Roomba? <laughs> this is from a few years ago, um, but smart devices became an extra version of this where we have all of these tools in our homes that are extracting information from us, right? taking data that we don't have control over what becomes data. The data's purpose is not to actually enrich our lives, but rather to make the company more successful. And we have allowed our worlds, our lives, our homes to be increasingly mapped for all of, of these purposes. But unlike the participatory web, the difference is we can't ever see where the threads go. We actually can't even see that the data is being pulled from us. There is very little visibility or transparency to this process and there is very little agency in our capacity to say yes or no to it. We, we cannot consent. I enjoy this picture. Sometimes this is how I feel when I am bringing my students onto platforms that I cannot read the terms of service because I am not a lawyer. And also, even if I read them and go through them, I have no control because the tools are free and they need to be free for me to be able to use them with my students, they could change next week. And so I do feel like I'm kind of saying, yes, class, let's go to the bathroom. How many of you have touched a keyboard since I started talking? Probably a few, that's legit, that's fine, that's great. If you're on the Wi-Fi, do you know what has happened to the information that you have put in or deleted. You don't know. I'm not saying anything bad has happened, but just we don't know. We do not know what is going on around us. And while in this space, what the contract is with the Wi-Fi may be fine, systems like enclosure and extraction amplify the structural inequalities, the racism, the classism, the sexism, who gets heard, whose threads get passed along, and much more whose information gets used against them is something that, again, is largely non-transparent but has real embodied impacts on us and on the learners that we potentially work with or impact. Chris Gilliard's work, how many of you know Chris Gilliard? He used to be hyper visible on Twitter. That was his, his, his name, his at name. He is now on Blue Sky. Um, he has done a lot of work on digital redlining and the ways in which unequal power structures, particularly in institutions, can also amplify some of those um, structural inequalities, et cetera. And it is because algorithms, right, when we turn information over to algorithms, they are categorizing. And they categorize in ways that reflect the structures that we are in. So, 
this. This continues to get more depressing, I realize. Um, this amplifies disinformation. This amplifies societal polarization. Um, this distorts our social and community instincts. And I think we are all seeing some of that in our world over the last six, seven years, and also very much very recently. Um, this is the work of uh, Zainab Tufekshi, uh, who is uh, in North Carolina, um, and she has talked for years about the ways in which turning all of this participatory capacity over to commercial entities um, does not enable us control. And what happens <laughs> is that the participatory pieces on which Web 2.0 was built start to become secondary and irrelevant to the ways our, the tools are structured and what they are, okay, we can't watch this anymore. <laughs> Apparently no children were actually harmed in the making of that picture. And we see this in education as well. And this is the work of Ben Williamson, who is uh, based in Edinburgh. Um, often things that we are being sold in education are technological fixes, right, for the problem of education. Because if you conceive something and frame something as a problem, it's really easy to swan in and be like, here, I've got it for you. Here's your solution. Um, but that does not necessarily build on the participatory pieces. And recently, we have seen the Web 3.0 woohoo hype growing. Um, NFTs, the semantic web, these are not participatory concepts. These are black boxes, as Bruno Latour would say, which is not quite Foucault, but uh, they are literally concepts that most of us are not meant to understand or engage with in empowered ways. They are meant to be things that just work and we turn things over to them, right, in this forthcoming future or vision. Now, the NFTs piece, I hope no one has um, major investments here and has lost them, but this is from an article in August that mentioned that the vast majority of NFTs are now worthless because largely that piece was a hype cycle that got built up. No one really understood how it was going to work out, and this is broadly how it has worked out, not so successfully. Whew. Does everyone need a little like shake it off feeling now? <laughs> I apologize, but I think it's important that we talk about the reality of where we are and some of the things that we don't like to talk about in underneath the work that we do. Into this fraught space. Suddenly, last November 30th, ChatGPT got released. How many of you uh, were kind of amazed by what happened so quickly after that? I know I was. Like, I understood that AI existed before that, but not in a way that I could show to my mom or show to my students or frankly even operate myself particularly effectively. Um, now, ChatGPT and its other versions, generative AI in the collection, I asked uh, the image version, ChatGPT4, uh, to make a picture of me doing a presentation. I noticed that it called it HagGPT and I was hurt. <laughs> I don't know if that means it doesn't know its own name or it was actively trolling me. <laughs> but um, let's go with the former. Uh, I thought that was funny enough to put up there. So I'd just like to take a, another little pause. Uh, let's take a couple of minutes for table conversation, okay? What 
have you heard about Jenna? And I, I assume, given the conference that it, this is, that many of you are quite familiar. But just share with the folks at your table, five minutes, I'll stop you then. What have you heard, what excites you, and what concerns you about Gen AI or ChatGPT? Okay. I just realized I too can walk around. <laughs> 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 Twenty more seconds, folks, just to wrap up, please. Okay, with apologies, I'm gonna call you back here. I am curious, thumbs up or not, uh, that seemed like pretty productive table conversation. People have things to say. How many of you get to be in maybe varied conversations about this with people with different perspectives on a regular basis. How many of you do? That's great. I think that that's one of the richest ways to build on community in order to keep shaping your ideas about these things. Um, excellent. I would love to hear back what people said at the tables, but I too am conscious of the time. 
So I'm going to leave those conversations as having been hopefully very valuable to you. Um, and when we come to conversation and questions at the end, if folks want to build on sharing any of those key things, that will be absolutely relevant. Is that okay? Okay. What I want to think about is how does the existence of easily accessible, free Gen AI shape and frame our conversation about empowerment in digital education? This is a, um, I think it was actually a blue sky post uh, from three days ago, four days ago, five days ago, I can't count. <coughs> AI, according to this person, just killed Excel. Now, I was like, oh, no more Excel. That's very empowering for me. Because, <laughs> because it's literally been 25 years that I've been trying to remember which field the form goes in. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I welcome our new whatever that is, overlords, for reasons. <laughs> Fine. Oh. There are also really specific education and research focused tools that promise us freedom, right? From a lot of the drudgery ends of some of the things that many of us do. So I work in research and the thing that I hate most about research is citation and formatting and even my Zotero still doesn't really do what I want it to, although I have been to many workshops. And there is a tool called Kenius that can apparently generate me a AI reference list that is not a disaster. Um, and there's a part of me that's intrigued by that because of the hours of my time and grad students' time and training grad students' time that goes in to trying to get those things right. Because a citation list does have a right answer. There's also the tool Diffit. How many of you teach? Okay. For those who teach, Diffit is a teacher-focused Gen AI tool that not only can generate lesson plans like ChatGPT does, but does a reasonably nice, and this was brought to me by my Bachelor of Education pre-service teacher student research assistants who were like, we found the mother load. <laughs> um, and honestly, it does a reasonable job of bringing things out for using in education. It does that synthesizing work, right? It offers some efficiency in creating the stuff that sometimes you need to teach in exciting and participatory ways. Anytime that I want to do something that's an activity with students, I have to think of that or find it somewhere in, as an OER or potentially, apparently, get Diffit to create it. So this is the promise. It's freedom from formulaic work, right? It's a place to start and then edit from. I used to say to my students 15 years ago, look, I don't mind, use Wikipedia. It's a great place to start. If you don't know anything about <coughs> enclosure in the Middle Ages, <laughs> the Wikipedia article can be a place to begin. You do not want to write a thesis based on the Wikipedia article. But I feel like there are ways in which Gen AI can offer us some of those same things in a superpowered kind of way. Great. But freedom for who? And empowerment for whom? I am currently doing a little quick piece of research. At the University of Windsor, we have a community of inquiry, um, which is just basically a drop in, used to be once a week and moved to once a month, of faculty, staff, anybody who wants to kind of hop on a Teams call and be like, did you see this with the Gen AI? Or here's how I'm using it. Or basically to have the table conversations that you are having with different people coming from different faculties, different backgrounds. And based on that, I'm working with a couple of students to talk with faculty about how they're using it and make a short video. And I was in the video conversation with one of my colleagues from social work the other day who was really clear that for him, because he is teaching critical perspectives on society, He's aware that what Gen AI is doing, it, it, it's not, I think we all know that Gen AI is not intelligent, right? But what it is doing is an incredibly quick and efficient and capable job of trawling 
the web, like a scallop dragger, that's my maritime background, um, and pulling together these things that we can use. But because of the way that the web was populated and the fact that in spite of the participatory spirit of Web 2.0, most of the voices and content out there is still very much global north. It privileges certain voices, certain cultures, and it privileges the dominant perspective. And so it is, if we turn all of this knowledge making, if we turn knowledge abundance over willy-nilly to Gen AI, then we are just going to have an increasingly um, narrow version kind of replicated back at us. And I think we were already on that path anyway with a lot of things, right? Has any, uh, <laughs> how many of you have seen a Marvel movie? Do you know how many Marvel movies there are? This summer when Barbie came out and they were talking about how, um, how successful it was, my kids and I ended up looking up the top 20 top grossing movies ever. I believe there are only one or two, Barbie being one of them, that isn't a franchise. Because this is the way in which capitalism works and feeds us, hey look, that worked last time, have some more, have some more. Um, but Gen AI also works that way, and I think we need to be very cautious when we think about empowerment in the digital in this space. My partner calls Gen AI, and I love this, auto-tune for knowledge. Right? Rather than individual voices, what you have is this cultural output that seems very innocuous, very bland, very pleasant, but also makes everybody sound the same. If you have ever received, as a teacher, something that you're pretty sure was written by Gen AI, probably the tell or the flag was the extraordinarily formal tone and the complete absence of really anything in it at this point. The reality is, if we're going to talk about this, we need to recognize that particularly with Gen AI, we are in a gold rush period, right? Everybody and their pet cat is out there hustling to try to figure out how to get rich with these tools. And some of that obscures the issues of labor and equity under Gen AI. The fact that if it's trawling the internet, and I think that we have all been on the internet long enough to recognize that the internet is full of junk, violence, racism, porn, hate, etc. The fact that Gen AI doesn't turn that up for us is because OpenAI, the company, which is not based in Kenya, um, used Kenyan workers paying them less than $2 an hour to traumatize themselves going through that stuff so that it doesn't serve it back up to us, right? Um, some of the most famous authors in the world are recognizing that the, the plots and all of the, the core creative ideas of their work were fed into this stuff with no recompense, no compensation. So there are all kinds of issues of labor and equity there, all kinds of issues of climate. Digital is not climate neutral. Servers are extremely energy uh, utilizing, I guess. And I thought that this was fascinating. Emissions from computing are apparently higher than for air travel at this point. So where some people say, oh, I have, Gen I have ChatGPT on all the time and I'm just using it for everything, I think we need to think increasingly about the ways in which our practices and our understanding of what this is and who it is for um, have impacts in the world. And it's shaping and polluting the web. So increasingly, there was something last month where uh, Google returned a really visibly wrong answer about, it was like, is there a country in Africa that starts with K? It was literally two slides ago. It's Kenya. And Google was like, no, uh-uh, there almost is, but, and it's because of the way that the responses have been 
have been integrated with AI. Um, so we are in a very, very strange time. I think that those of us in this room have an opportunity to, as was said earlier, think about the futures that we want to build. Possibly by going home. It's been lovely. I don't think we are going to run away. I don't actually think that we can. We need to figure out from this point, remembering that the web was actually made of people, right? That we can build something that does not turn everything over to forces that we don't understand. There's actually a Bloom's taxonomy for AI use, and I think that that's great. Um, it amazes me that a taxonomy from 1956 continues to be as powerful as it is in education, but here we are. Super. But here's what I think we need to do at this point. In our world right now, there are some really visible fault lines that the creation of these new tools and these new capacities make clear, right? Pressure points pushing against each other. For those of us who are teaching, we have lost the leverage of what scarcity means. We can no longer assume that if we push a grade or a you need to do this to get the credential or whatever, on the um, seesaw here that the process, the purpose of those assigned texts, the purpose of the five paragraph essay on what you read was meant to actually get students to do the reading, right? It was meant to get them to, to think. If they can just do the outputs without ever engaging, then we can't assume that that pressure point raises up the learning any longer. I don't know what we do in education with that fulcrum actually broken by this. But I think we need to recognize that it is, right? We cannot confuse learning with the outputs that students give anymore. We need to draw pedagogically on traditions like participatory learning that allow for some form of connection, a fist bump, a recognition of other humans out there that means that the engagement of a human in that moment, that recognition, that network, is getting tweaked, triggered, made alive. And it probably means we need to give up our enchantment with things having right answers because AI companies can sell that to us as the day is long. So this is from, again, just a couple of days ago, but big tech firms are likely to steer AI in a direction that serves their economic rather than public interests, despite the grave societal harms, which I have outlined, that this has inflicted. I don't want to live in a world where education means maximizing screen time, turbocharging, invasive data collection, and amplifying advertising, right? So that students can turn me in something that they didn't write or create, and that I am probably going to not grade, but give automatic feedback on. That is an arms race that I don't want to be part of. So in this critical window, I think we need to think about what we're doing, who we're empowering, and have it focus not on credentialism and corporatism, um, not that those entities cannot be partners, but rather that we need to keep the human as part of this. We can focus on learning in human terms, on human agency, and keep the participatory tradition that many of the people in this room have some understanding of. 
because we came into digital work pre-pandemic. Participatory processes for digital resistance and empowerment focus on inquiry, connection, critical analysis, human voice, search. Our search processes are becoming polluted. We got to figure out how to ourselves and with our students find stuff that we can verify and contribution to knowledge abundance so students can put stuff out there and have it connected to by others. We need to set the frame and not let it be set for us and we need to keep learning in focus. And I think the key piece is with digital tools, but not for. Because some futures are not freedom or empowerment. How you doing? <laughs> sure, that would be great. Um, I'd love to have a conversation. I know Simon, I think you have a mic and maybe Robert, you're gonna moderate. Let me know how we're gonna do this. Uh, I would love to keep talking and I'd love to hear from you. How do you think we can do this? Where are the pressure points that we can band together and try to exert some agency over. Yeah, do we have a mic for this? I think Simon's just getting the mic. Thank you, Simon. Oh, I just realized what my hair is doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's working. Boop, boop. Oh, it's definitely working now. Thank you so much for that. I was gonna say invigorating talk. It is invigorating, but in many different ways. I did write down my thought because I didn't wanna ramble, so I hope that's okay. So as you were talking, to, especially towards the end, I was just writing down that, especially in North America, we've treated education and higher education like such a business, almost increasing the number of our students or our clients without real structures of support. And our own provost has said in the past, that we're in the business of students and to deliver curriculum. So as someone who's working in learning design, we're in a team of teaching and learning, how can we go back to a model of that support and learning and, enc and encouraging inquiry when our classes have just been increased, 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 and we've just been, you know, kind of, we cater to having content or having tests that only care about that output, that correct answer. And, how can we go to that model of support and learning? And anyone with any tips, anyone who has tried successfully to do this, especially in really large classes, please help. What, what are your thoughts? What are your ideas? And anyone that can talk to going back to that care level, that learning, that personal learning. For sure. I think that two things. Uh, one, I think that needs to be one of the exhortations I leave you with today is talk about this stuff. If you have ideas, share them. If you have tips, put them out there. Um, because I do think that as humans, we do learn from the environment around us when we are enabled to. And both institutionally, structurally, and digitally, structurally, I have been in this field long enough to see that enclosure taking away some of that. So I wanna use this opportunity while we are together to talk about these things. I think that the institutional structural piece, I feel bad for the decision makers because they have been encroached on to suddenly turn out these value propositions for education that are based on terms that are not the terms of learning. Um, and so we have giant classes and we have all of these because we're underfunded, right? Because, um, I also, so I think that's one of the fault lines. I think one of the fault lines is the institutional structure of education right now is we are not actually funding um, the capacity to learn in the ways that we, we understand how learning works, but we keep wanting it to be more efficient. And I'm not sure, particularly in a world of 
um, not web knowledge abundance, but generative AI knowledge abundance, that we can continue down that path without literally selling the farm of what, ed what higher education is. Because eventually, if we keep trying to win at the game of make it more efficient, make it a better credential, the, we have a, a kind of grandfather clause that allows institutions of higher education to exist. And uh, I'm not sure that they will in a world of automatic answers if the frame of automatic answers is what we let people buy into. So I think we need to make a value proposition for something that goes deeper than that for the idea that actually giving over all power and control to black boxes that we can't see inside and have agency over is not a great idea. Um, and that's gonna be, again, I realize it's not a cheery message. I realize that it is um, a difficult conversation sometimes to have. I think that we need to figure out what our value proposition is um, in those terms. What what are we offering? What does it mean to learn? And maybe start refocusing as much as we can on that. I'll stop that there. Okay, I'm just gonna take a, a question from the Zoom that yeah. is in Great. the room with us. This is a question from Alex Shuda. Colleges in Ontario were created to provide a comprehensive program of career-oriented post-secondary education and training to assist individuals in finding and keeping employment to meet the needs of employers and the changing work environment and to support the economic and social development of yep. their local communities and diverse communities. So this is a um, on-cat quote of their mandate. Now, where can or should employers and industry partners be part of this critical conversation that you're bringing up? It's a good question because I think um, because the critical conversation often gets left or siloed to universities, and there is a different mandate for colleges. And when I used to work in adult learning, I worked with colleges more than with universities. I still think that in spite of the focus on can people get jobs, et cetera, um, that there is a place for critical inquiry in colleges. Um, and I wonder if even though the pathway is meant to be considerably clearer between we take in a student and we turn them out and they have the skills and readiness for this specific industry job, there has still been a failure to keep up as those jobs have often shifted. Um, with what that means and to engage even the employers in the critical conversation of what does it mean to work in this field right now? Um, so I was working with uh, community colleges in Prince Edward Island before I came to Ontario uh, in an adult learning position and there, it was during the time when there was a peak focus on coding, right? Um, coding was going to be the future and the answer and all of those pieces. Uh, if you have done anything with relation to chat GPT encoding, that whole industry is changing very quickly, I guess would be the most polite way that I could put it. Those promises that we were so sure that that was the thing that was going to be the future driver, th those have changed too. So this is not something that just impacts universities, right? All of the things that we want people to be able to do, we need to be able to have robust, open conversations about what does all of this change mean and is, is there value in this going forward, right? Yes, we have invested a whole bunch of credentials or businesses or whatever in making this work, but are we making it work so that we're walking off a cliff that's hanging there in front of us? So I, I think and I'm not sure that I've addressed this directly, but to the question from the person online, I don't think that this situation that we're in, this kind of almost off the cliff piece, is unique to universities, and I do think that includes 
colleges, but I am not sure, I do not have the answer for how we structure these conversations, um, particularly when they run on often four-year political mandates. Jenny, uh, do you have the mic? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I'll be quick then. Uh, so firstly, love the talk, very interested, love uh, a lot of the kind of McLuhanist lens for these kind of participatory tools. I'm wondering if you've encountered, um, maybe not as like an antidote to this, but one of the things that I've come across when I'm thinking about how we get students to engage digitally or how we, I guess, move students to a more holistic model of learning is actually indigenizing the way that we design our education. Um, there's some really interesting research coming out of BC uh, by a woman named Michelle Lefevre who talks about moving mm -hmm. blooms into a kind of a more, she kind of maps blooms onto a medicine wheel, like a four mm -hmm. quadrant approach. Uh, is that something you've encountered? Have you, have you kind of played around with the idea of indigenizing the way we teach and learn a little bit, almost as um, a kind of a way to sidestep some of these, these larger digital concerns or a way to address the more holistic learner needs? I think that's absolutely a great question. Um, re really more like a great possible pathway. Um, I think that taking core principles that do not necessarily only value outputs is very much what I'm talking about and is very much aligned with a lot of indigenizing processes. I'm also very conscious of the word taking um, which would be my embodied positionality in that. Um, so I think that our university is lucky enough to have an indigenous scholar um, who may or may not be here um, in our Office of Open Learning who can work with faculty on those things. And there is a lot of alignment between some of the principles of open and participatory learning and some communities indigenous principles because I'm also wary of the totalizing impact there but yeah I think that that is definitely one path that is important and possibly may make alliances in this moment um, that would allow many of us uh, to forward some of these conversations okay we're gonna have one last question for okay. Dr. Stewart great thank you thank you so much um, for your insight Bonnie I'm curious about learners, because we keep talking about what we're doing to them or for them or about them, um, but where you imagine the levers are and the timing is for empowering learners, because there's no learning that ever takes place without a learner doing it. They don't learn unless they actually are involved in the learning. Where are the levers to empower learners to say, I'm not going to learn this way. I don't want to learn the way that you're putting me in 300 student classes. I don't want to learn that way. Yep. I'm giving you money <laughs> to put me in a class of 500. Uh, where is that empowerment, do you think, in the, in the scheme of things that we could do for learners or do with you, learners? Do you mean in like the, the broader system broader or do you system. mean in the individual? Yeah, no, broader system. I just, I'm looking right. for the pathway to, to um, empower learners with more knowledge about their own power? At risk of being too pat or too tidy, uh, because I don't think that it is obviously a pat or a simple process, I do think that giving, that creating experiences, um, so if you are learner facing or working with faculty who are learner facing or um, working to design ideas, for folks to engage with, giving people some hands-on experience of that moment of connection and that they can gain something from that, that fist bump that like, oh, I got this from you. I'm gonna take that into me and I'm gonna go out and do something with it. That process is that kind of lighting a fire, right? That um, rather than in education, that, that lighting a fire in somebody. And the more that we can make that value proposition to students that this exists, in a world where we have educated them all along to believe that there are 
right answers to everything and they're trying very hard to find that right answer and when we ask them open-ended questions, they're like, well, what is the right answer for that? I think that we need to engage in learning and education that values uncertainty, that values different forms of outputs. So even us being able to, you know, again, it's not a solution, but to use things like UDL so that students can communicate their understandings in different modalities, right, and not have to be forced. The less that we go for the single box, um, the more I think we have a chance of students coming through our systems with some sense that there's more than what they're being offered. Um, and if we don't do that, then, then we're not going to succeed, right? The, the purpose of learning is to send somebody on a journey and we need to find ways of educating that do that. All right, Thank I think we're out of much, time. Thank you very much, Dr. Stewart. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.